I think the first historical fact I learned when I arrived in Westfield uh, many decades ago was that Westfield was known as the Whip City. Over the years, I was constantly reminded about that because there was whip memorabilia everywhere. Uh, there were repurposed whip buildings throughout the city. Uh, when I would give talks to various civic groups, I quite often would be presented with a souvenir whip. Uh, there even was a surviving whip factory in town which was still making buggy whips on the old machines the old way. It was pretty hard to miss Westfield as the whip city. It wasn't until many years later that I learned that there was another industry in town that had made Westfield famous across the country and that in fact many people outside of Westfield knew it not as the whip city but as the church organ city. Between 1840 and 1900, Westfield manufactured about 1,000 church organs. 860 of them were manufactured by the Johnson Organ Company. To this day, there are national organizations of church organ enthusiasts, church organ impresarios and collectors who write about the Johnson Organ Company and Westfield as the church organ city. This church organ business has largely been forgotten in the city of Westfield. This is the cover of the only catalog that in 40 years of dealing in antiques, books, and paper, I've ever seen. That catalog is today housed in the archives, the Westfield Athenaeum. Most people in town never heard of the Johnson Organ Company. All of its buildings are gone, and all of the, what once were Johnson organs in all of the churches in town, they're all gone also. But in fact, this was an important part of Westfield history. William A. Johnson was born in New York State. His father was a contractor in the building of the Farmington Canal. In other words, the canal that ran from New Haven to Northampton through the city of Westfield. That's how he ended up in Westfield. As an adolescent, he was apprenticed to a mason, a contractor, a brick builder. He learned the business and eventually built a number of buildings in Westfield as he became an independent contractor. One of the buildings that he worked on was the Methodist Church in town. Now he had recently married. He married Mary Ann Douglas. Someday I'm going to give a talk just on her. She deserves a biography of her own. She's a very unusual woman. She was a painter, a portrait painter in particular. And for much of the 19th century, she gained an independent living as a portrait artist. She painted over a thousand portraits. And during the height of her fame in the 1860s and 70s, she was making as much as two and three thousand dollars a year selling her portraits. Now you want to keep in mind that a skilled laborer during that time might have made $500 a year. Luckily, she created a catalog of all the works she painted, who she painted them for, and what she got for those paintings, and that catalog, as well as a number of her paintings, are kept here in the Athenaeum. As I said, one of the first big contracting jobs that William Johnson got was working on the new Methodist Church. In 1843, 
the Methodists built a big new church on the corner of School Street. During the construction, the Methodists decided to do something rather revolutionary. They decided to include a church organ. They bought it from Boston. It came to Westfield in pieces, and they needed someone to assemble it. William assembled it, was fascinated by this, and that winter decided that he would try to build one himself. In the winter of 1843-44, he built one. The next winter, and of course in the wintertime, construction business was down, he had time on his hands, he built two more. In 1846, he seemed to build another one. Now he built all of those organs in his home. The home sat on Elm Street, directly across from Orange Street. The home had originally belonged to his wife's parents. You can see that this home has had numerous extensions built onto it. The back end of this home served as his first factory. Now the home survived into the 20th century. This is the way it looked in the 1930s. Now the home is now gone, but this building next to it survives. Some of you may remember it as the Mill End store. Uh, today, there's a beef jerky store in it. It's directly across from Orange Street. And this remained the home of William and Mary Ann Douglas Johnson uh, until their deaths. What kind of organs was he building? Well, these initial organs were really very small and very simple. They were a slightly enlarged version of a parlor organ, uh, the sort of thing the late 19th century had in many homes. This is the earliest surviving Johnson organ. This is the 16th one he built, and it exists today in Heath, Massachusetts. You can see it's a very simple case, very limited number of pipes, but this is the sort of thing that he was building. Another early example is this one. This is number 43, and it was it exists today in Montague, Mass. It still survives. Again, very simple case, fairly small, uh, the kind of pump organ that the organist would play and pump at the same time. In 1849, Johnson decided to strike out big, and he built the first slightly larger or church organ as a commercial venture. Now, because he'd had no previous uh, experience at this, he did it on spec. He built it for the first congregational church in town. He built it, put it in the church, and said if it was satisfactory, the church agreed to pay him $1,500. Now, this is what the original church looked like. It was a wooden structure. It exists right where the present First Congregational Church did. It was built in 1800. It was removed in 1861. This is a photo from the late 1850s. But that organ in 1849, it was number 13 that he constructed. This begins his career. Now that he's decided to make it a full-time business, he needs something other than back rooms in his house for a factory. And so he builds his first factory directly across the street from his house on the corner of Orange and Elm. Now, this doesn't look right to any of you today. You have to remember that in those days, the railroad, which runs through the center of town, or ran through the center of town, 
and is up on an elevated track. In those days, it ran flat. It was not elevated. So that Elm Street is here, but it sat right on the corner where there is a uh, restaurant today. He had somewhere between 15 and 20 employees during those years. The problem was is that that factory was in a place that was prone to flood. Uh, he was flooded out in 1852, he was flooded out in 1853. This was before Westfield built a serious, uh, series of dikes and protected that part of the property. And the constant floods and constant danger, and also the fact he wasn't a very good businessman, meant that by 1856 he was bankrupt. The businessmen in town, however, liked the idea of having this business in town. They decided to reorganize his business, to not call in all of his loans, and to financially support him, to put him back on his feet. The creditors reorganized the business, and his foreman, William Gladwell, a name that will survive in Westfield for well over a century in other businesses. William Gladwin, the foreman, became a partner. Now Johnson's skill was as a voicer and tuner, and this is the part of the story that no one quite has an explanation for. Uh, there's no history of him having a musical background. There's no history of him uh, singing in church choirs or playing an instrument. But he was highly skilled as the person who could create the tones for each of the pipes. Now, the pipes were very, very simple. It's simple, an open column of air with a stopper on the end. And according to the pitch on the stopper, that creates the tone. The rest of the construction is relatively simple. Uh, any good New England mechanic of the 19th century could put one together, but it's the voicing and the toning that the Johnson organs were famous for, and one of the reasons that their fame survives to this day. The other thing he was very good at it was as a salesman. Uh, William A. Johnson, began to travel all over the United States selling his organs. Uh, he was noted as a hail fellow well met, a friend of all he met, uh, a joiner. He's one of the founders of the Masonic order in town. Uh, he uses the Masonic connection to join with Masons across the country. And in fact, many of his church organs ended up in Masonic temples. The organ company grew with the city. Westfield began to prosper mid-19th century. And in 1861, the Congregationalists decided to build a new church. And in the process, they decided that their numbers were so big that they would split the congregation and build two churches, a first congregational and a second congregational and Johnson organs were placed in both. Now this is the new First Congregational Church. It's the brick church that sets on the green today. The steeple, of course, was much different, but in that church, by the 1860s, Johnson is building much more magnificent constructions. This is church organ number 112. By the way, the Johnson catalog that I showed you at the beginning of this, that includes a list of all of the extant organs by date and number and place. The same year, the second congregational church installed an organ. Again, a much larger, much more magnificent instrument. And 15 years later, the Methodists themselves built a big new church 
and they installed this one. That's a magnificent interior of what was then the largest church in town. Now, between 1861, when the first and second church organs were built, numbers 112 and 113, and 1876, 15 years later, when church organ number 472 were installed. That means that in those 15 years, the Johnson Organ Company built 350 of these huge church organs that spread all over the country. As far as California, these organs were sent. Johnson traveled with the organs because he helped install them wherever they were placed. This company was very successful. So successful, in fact, that a couple of his employees, George Turner and John Steer, his brother-in-law, decided that they would go out on their own and create their own church organ company. So by the early 1870s, Westfield had two church organ companies, the Johnson Organ Company and the Steer and Turner Organ Company. Another employee, Edwin Hedges, was the specialist in the creation, the building of the pipes. Now, as I said, Johnson was the tuner of those pipes, but someone had to literally take the sheet metal and form it into the pipes. And that was Edwin Hedges' job. So in the mid-1870s, Hedges broke away and formed his own company, the Hedges Pipe Organ Company, supplying organs to both of the competitors in town, as well as uh, church organ companies in Boston and New York. In 1871, Johnson's company headquarters, his factory on the corner of Warren Street, burned to the ground. He had to start over again. He did. He built a new factory on the banks of the Westfield River, right at the head of the covered bridge that crossed the river. He actually built two buildings there. And grew even larger. By this time, he's got 60 employees. But as I said, that area of town was constantly plagued by floods. And in 1878, the biggest flood that had ever struck Westfield destroyed much of that area of downtown. The Johnson Organ Company survived, but just barely. His competitor, Directly across the roadway, Steer and Turner was absolutely wiped out. Now the Steer and Turner building sat approximately where the beginning of the North Bridge, North Side Bridge, is on the Westfield River today. Johnson's company sat on the side where the South coming bridge was on the other side. So directly across from each other. And the main flood wiped Steer and Turner out. They moved to Springfield and started over again with a small church organ company that lasted in Springfield for 40 years. With all this coming and going of personnel, Johnson had to add new employees and new partners, and he took into the business his son, William H. Johnson. And in 1871, he made his son a partner. Now, this was probably not a good business decision. William A. Johnson was a hail fellow well met. He was liked by everyone. He was a salesman. William H. Johnson, he had the musical talent that his father didn't. 
He was noted as quite a skilled organist, but he was also imperious, arrogant, a bad businessman, and not liked not only by his employees, but also by the people he had to do business with. There's one story told about him, maybe apophrical, sounds like the famous Captain Queeg of Kane Mutiny. Uh, it's said that he carried a cami bag of small jewels in his pocket, which he was constantly fingering and counting. Sounds a little strange to me, but that's a story that has survived from the 19th century. William H. Johnson, unlike his father, who continued to live in that rather modest little house of his in-laws, William H. Johnson decided to build himself a mansion. This is the home he constructed on Court Street, the corner of Day and Court. The house survives to this day. Attorney Coulter had his office in that building. Uh, the house was described as entirely interior decorated with rare woods, which the company had been importing for its much more magnificent church organ cases. Uh, originally, the house also had its own organ. Uh, as I told you, William H. was noted as a skilled organist. Later owners uh, stripped much of the woodwork and removed the organ, but the house survives. By the late 1890s, William A. Johnson has gotten very elderly and unable to keep up with the business. His son is not helping the business. And so in 1898, the Johnson Organ Company shuts down. It was taken over by another of his employees, Emmons Howard. And the Emmons Howard Organ Company, occupying the same properties, continues to build organs in town for another 20 years. The elderly Johnsons sell their home in 1899 and move in with their son. In 1901, William A. dies. In 1906, Mary Ann dies. And in 1922, William H. dies with no heirs. So the family is extinct in town. In 1920, Steer and Turner have their factory in Springfield burned to the ground. They come back to Westfield by the faltering Amon's Hammond business and survive for a couple of years. We're staggering along at the point in time where building church organs is not profitable at much anymore. Another company, Skinner, takes them over. And finally, in 1928, all the organ companies in Westfield go bankrupt and quit. It is the end of the church organ business in Westfield. Now, there were Johnson organs still in town. There was a Johnson organ placed in the Baptist church when they built their new church on uh, Elm Street in the 1870s. But these organs, most of them were, as I said, fairly simple construction, even though they looked quite ornate. Most of them, like all church organs, existed on pump air. In the mid-19th century, that air came from human beings literally pumping air into the organs. And the big church organs took, uh, if you were going to play an organ concert, you had to have a brace of hardy men pumping like crazy to keep air in them. Some of them, like the First Congregational Church, created water engines. I'm not sure, quite sure how they worked, but uh, water power 
pumped air into the organs. And then in the late 19th century, they could be motorized. But this took modifications of the structure. And so in the 1920s, when they began to modernize these organs, the Baptists took theirs out. Now, another organ was in the Universalist Church, which was on the corner of Chapel and Elm. Uh, the Universalists sold their business to the Masons, and that became the Masonic Hall for 60 years. Uh, the Johnsons were closely associated with the Masons, and the Masons continued to play the organ. When the Masons moved to Broad Street, they dismantled the organ, took it to Broad Street with them, and eventually sold the pipes and many parts of it uh, to a church in Agawam. I don't know how much of the Johnson organ survives in that church, but it was sent there in the 1960s. The second congregational church organ was torn apart when that church moved out Western Avenue early in the 1960s. And the new church created a beautiful new modern organ. Johnson is gone from there. Same thing happened to the Methodists. They had that big beautiful organ, but when they built the new church, they wanted a new, more modern organ which exists in the church today. Only the first congregational church organ, Johnson organ, survived. As late as 1970, this is what it looked like. But in 1976, the church decided again it wanted to modernize. There were numerous problems with this organ. It needed to be electrified, and that created a whole series of new issues, and so they put in a fisk. Some, they sold much of the pipes and the rest of the structure uh, to an Episcopal church in Lockport, New York. However, some of the old pipes still survive in the basement of the Congregational Church to this day as does the connections for the water pump that made the old church work. If you want to see a fully functioning Johnson organ today, one of the places you can look is Holyoke Community College. In 1896, one of the last of the Johnson church organs, number 838, was placed in the Northampton Mental Hospital. It survived there until the hospital closed in the 1960s. Then it was removed and it had a number of twists and turns in its history, but it eventually ended up at Holyoke Community College where it was re rebuilt, restored, and is played today. In fact, of the 860 named Johnson organs that were constructed, there are 106 of them still in functioning use in the United States today in 17 different states. 32 of those organs are in Massachusetts. There are still organ conventions today of specialists who meet and talk about the Johnson organ construction and who travel around the country playing Johnson organs. They are still famed for their tone and for the complexities of their sound. In Westfield, the Johnson Organ Company has no existence. The buildings are all gone. The organs are all gone. The memory is all gone. But once upon a time, just as Westfield was the whip city, it was also noted as 
the church organ city.